Uh, this is a lot more people than I expected, so it's good to see there's some interest in package base, I guess. <laughs> this is a good deal. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Thanks. Yeah. So really quick introduction. So Chris Moore, um, VP of Engineering at IAM Systems, been around BSD CAN. We were debating it on the way over. I don't know if this is my 13th or 14th year. I messed the year due to flight difficulties. If you guys remember the year the Chicago airport had a fire tower or tower fire? That kind of messed up our travel plans. So uh, anyway, lots of fun. And looking forward to discussing some work we've done on package base and getting some feedback. And I want this to be participatory, so please yeah, let's interrupt and have conversations because we're still trying to figure out what needs to be solved as well so we can finally get package based packages. So, just a quick look back just to bring people up to speed if this is maybe your first foray into package base. I went and looked through the wiki page history and pulled this out of the history that the first public call for testing for base packages was announced May 2nd, 2016, and that was in preparation for an 11.0 release. And then since then, we've had um, efforts to get it into 12.0 release, and now maybe 12.x, and we'll see. So our experience with package base, and when I say our, I'm talking um, as the guy who's kind of behind TrueOS, PCBSD back in the day, and of course at IX Systems, we've attempted to use this internally. So uh, summer of 2019, we shifted the TrueOS project over to FreeBSD's package base system. We developed a lot of new build system frameworks to wrap that up and turn it up, you know, package everything, turn it into ISOs, and we more or less built a lot of tools on top of it, including updating tools. We switched over to using it by late 2017 uh, entirely, and I finally got to retire FreeBSD Update, the server we were running to support that. That, that was a huge personal victory. So, by mid-2018, so last year, we began the process of getting some really early builds of FreeNAS 12 and uh, another unannounced project at the time called True Command at IX Systems, and we wanted to build those on top of package base. Um, we ran into some of the same issues, which I think people who have used package base right now are well familiar with, issues with the config file, merging and updating, that's been a common theme. Uh, we ran into some issues with meta packages and granularity with so many different packages in the base package system. Okay, it wasn't really a big surprise. We knew what was coming. But then as we started to dive a little deeper and really go wild here trying to bring this into FreeNAS, we started running into some more challenging issues that were maybe more specific to our use case, but I suspect some of you have seen this as well. Uh, one of the first ones, which we had a lot of internal arguments about, was we had issues between having two separate package repos. You have your base repo and you have your ports repo, and all the issues keeping those two in sync um, at any given time. We had issues with staging things. One gets staged before the other, and someone updates one and not the other, and it, it got very complicated very quick. So we went back and forth and had a lot of discussions about unifying that. We ended up indeed unifying it at one point with the base package solution that's in FreeBSD today. We also started running into issues with updating and installation with speed. In other words, with so many base packages, there's a lot of metadata operations in between going and installing all the individual packages, and we noticed a hit to our upgrade times and to our installation times. And then where it got more complicated is when we started bringing in a lot of FreeNAS's custom flags that we build with and without different things. And then we started noticing, oh, the dependencies, or lack of dependencies, if you will, are a little challenging dealing with this. And things that used to be there as a package have just disappeared with you know, setting something to without. So that became challenging, especially when you have people already running on the old package base and have the previous version. Package wasn't very good about cleaning those up and knowing what, what is indeed gone. Um, what was that, Joe? Repeat that. I said, I average upgrade time of at least 30 minutes to fetching 600 or more base packages during the upgrade process. Yeah, that was definitely a challenge as well. It doesn't download things in parallel, one packet after the other. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we. we a lot of little issues like that. It was kind of like death by a thousand paper cuts for us. Um, another big one was lack of flavor support. It was more or less, you had one thing. And, oh, so I don't know if someone remote is trying to join in. Um, we were generally unhappy with all the changes required to source to support this feature. I want to touch on this for a little bit. This was kind of important for us. So FreeNAS, we don't ship on head. 
and yeah, we do builds on head and try and experiment and play like every project should do. But really, we ship on stable. We ship on, we're still shipping on 11 right now. We're getting ready to move to 12. But what we found was, as we made improvements to package base, those of course go into our head branch, and bringing them back was becoming more and more difficult. There was a lot of wrangling and cherry picking and merge conflicts as things have drifted between the releases. And uh, that kind of goes hand in hand with, we weren't able to retroactively go back and build older releases with bug fixes to the package based process itself. That really bumped us out. Okay, so by about fall of last year, we had a few meetings about this. We decided to go ahead and abandon the existing package base due to these concerns. At the time, the consensus was we felt it was just really over-engineered and too complicated for our use case of building up clients out of it. Had a lot of neat technical things, but again, not the best, uh, best use case for what we needed to do. So, work begins. We gotta replace it with something. So we began working on new, new base packages. So we had some design goals right up front, things that we wanted to be able to accomplish. First of all, was we wanted to more closely mimic the disk file simplicity we have today with just a handful of packages to try and keep the upgrade time down, all the download times, all the metadata operations, all the possible points of failure because we found when you're fetching tons and tons of packages already, there's a lot of chances for network hiccups and other things to happen which uh, makes one of those fail. Um, we wanted it to be external to the base sources. This was a big one for us so that we could go back and arbitrarily package any version of FreeBSD. If we want to go back and package 9, I don't know why we would, we could do it. If we wanted to package 10, 11, 12, whatever, not a big deal. That also allows us to iterate quickly on package base and make changes and improvements and not be forced to go fetch the latest sources and then deal with bugs coming in from upstream ahead as well or changes in behavior which we're not ready to uh, take in for the FreeNAS project. Uh, we wanted to use the existing build tooling we've been running for years, Forks, been around forever, Pudrir, we've been using that for, gosh, I don't know how many years, maybe William, if you're in the room, you remember when that got brought in? Five or four years. Five or four years at this point, so I've written now a couple different build systems and they always, at the end of the day, ended up running Pudrir at some phase of the process and before it generated an ISO and spit an image out. So uh, we wanted to reuse that as much as possible. We also wanted to unify the base packages and port repositories into one, just to ensure 100% consistency. So when we do a push, we can be sure that the kernel we're shipping is matching any K mods that might come from the port tree and packages. Uh, we wanted to support any arbitrary combination of with and without flags that are choosing. We didn't want any complicated dependencies to have to chase down and headaches to resolve. And we wanted to support flavors via the usual porting mechanisms. The ports trees had flavors for a little while now. That was important to us. So we wanted to see if we could preserve that. Uh, that would allow us to easily change and update different uh, custom builds of FreeBSD as needed. We could just add a new flavor. And another big one was we wanted to have dependencies for ports. So where this really became important is when we did the DFS on Linux work, we started with getting it into the tree as a port instead of trying to merge it into head. And, you know, I have to build off another branch and be dealing with merges all the time. It's just much easier to toss a port in the tree and then have a dependency on base packages to say, oh, I'm not using base DFS. Please go ingest the version from ports and we'll use that. That's really sped up our development cycle a lot. So by the end of 2018, this was about a three month effort before we had something somewhat useful. We had implemented our initial base package port system. We created a small patch for Pudrir, um, which allows bootstrapping a jail, a Pudrir build jail, directly from the port tree or package base. So you didn't have to go and independently build a jail, you could just pull it right out of the package base system. We converted FreeNAS 12 and then true command to start using this. Uh, just recently, we did a call for testing to the FreeBSD community, so thank you for some of those here who have tested that, tried it out, and given us some feedback. And then a few days ago, we announced flavor support with initially three flavors, generic, minimal, and the DFS on Linux one, which I'm using mostly right now because that's another thing I'm very actively testing. So, quick overview, how does it work? What are some of the differences here? I, do I have to get everyone up to speed on how existing package base works, or does anybody have questions on that first? No? Okay, it's been around a while. Well, we threw it away, but... No. <laughs> 
So what we did is we started off with a new category in the ports tree called OS. I realized there's one called base. We chose not to use that because I didn't want to be dealing with merge conflicts right now. I just wanted to be able to pull ports in and be happy. Uh, we could merge it later, not a big deal. Uh, we created an initial source package. This was something I've been wanting for a long time. Source itself is a package. So when I go package install SRC, user SRC is populated with the sources and they are kept in lockstep with the version of user landing kernel I have installed. Run package upgrade, it gets upgraded along with. Fantastic, I have you know, again, wanted that for a long time. Um, that has gone ahead and built, there's an OS SRC port which goes ahead and builds that. Right now we have it set to pull the sources in from GitHub. We're just using GitHub tags the way a lot of ports are. It's easy, it's convenient. We added some hooks to the port so you can build from a locally checked out tree. So if that's your thing, you can do that as well, which is great if you haven't pushed stuff anywhere yet. Um, we then created two packages, one called Build World and Build Kernel. Those do pretty much what they're named. So they'll go ahead and run the initial build. And then they will package these into a single tar tarball, which we then stash in user dist, which is uh, important. We use this later to build the real base packages. We have a couple packages called userland-base, kernel, kernel debug, kernel symbols, blah, blah, blah. We chunk those out into individual packages. We're doing that right now. There's a review and fabricator for sub-packages. Is anybody familiar with that here? Or know what that is? So sub-packages will be something we could adopt for this down the road. It lets you build one pack, one port, if you will, and then turn it into multiple packages. This is how we're working around that for the moment. So that behavior could change as time goes on as this uh, work on sub-packages potentially lands in the port street. We'd be happy to make that shift when the time comes. Didn't want to depend on it for the time being because there's still argument over that review. And we'll let them get that all sorted out first before we go ahead and rely on it. And we found, frankly, it was really nice to have single tarballs of World and Kernel available because there are still a lot of tools out there that you can feed the tarball into um, to set up a jail or um, set up another Poudrier jail, for example. So it is pretty handy to have that available. So after we've done the builds, we have our tarballs. Again, we chunk things out. So we have an OS user land package. That's a meta package. That only exists so you can just do a package install user land and it installs all the dependencies. In this case, the dependencies would be user land base. That's all your base contents. And then you have optional dependencies on docs, lib32, tests, debug, et cetera. Um, that's also where we put flags so we can turn on dependencies on things like VFS on Linux. So when you install user land, if it, the ZOL flag is set, it'll automatically ingest sysutils ZOL. Um, again, we created patches for Poudrier, which adds a couple new uh, options, actually one mainly, but it, a new dash M ports option. So if you want to build a jail, you just point it at your ports tree. It'll go, oh, great, you have base packages here. Let me helpfully build those for you. It'll bootstrap the jail, and you're ready to rock and roll. Um, after it builds source, build world, build kernel on the host, it basically just installs the Poudre jail from those tarballs we generated, which uh, makes it pretty easy. Um, we patched uh, TrueOS's installer, FreeNAS installer, and now I've done a version of BSD install to use package install to do the installation. It was a very trivial patch. And then at that point, we went back to our regular day jobs and started working on pre 12 features and things related to our products. So it was pretty straightforward. About a month ago, we dipped back in, started adding flavor support, and got those more or less working. Pretty happy with them now. So Poudre will go through and rebuild World and Kernel with different flavor flags set, and you end up with a bunch of different packages to choose from, potentially. And I posted something in the mailing list on how you can uh, use those and change between flavors on the fly as well, which is pretty nice. I was actually concerned package wouldn't do that properly, but we found a way. <laughs> so uh, problems still to solve, and these are problems common to both package-based implementations. But of course, migrating from non-package-based to package-based. This is one where I'm looking for some feedback from different folks in this room for what your particular needs are. For FreeNAS, it's not is big of a problem for us because the way we handle stuff in Etsy is we throw it away and our database recreates everything at boot up. So we can just go ahead and install everything fresh and vanilla into a new boot environment, boot up, let the database handle its thing when it starts. Previously, obviously, for general adoption, we're going to need to solve this a little better. So we can bring in your existing Etsy comp files, package them up, make sure package tries to resolve the conflicts as it goes forward. I'm sure there's going to be challenges there. Um, some we're trying to resolve at the moment, correct? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. There's just issues. There, yeah, there's issues. You'll end yeah. up with stuff that doesn't merge cleanly, and that's one of the problems I'll mention here. 
we need, we'll need a tool to help manage these merge conflicts better at some point. I don't know if this is, some, this is something in the community, the consensus is we want to go into PKG directly, or does it need to go into a tool you run after you do PKG to go and clean up the bits that did not merge cleanly? Looking for advice here on how folks would recommend solving that. Any thoughts? This many people in the room, somebody's got an opinion, right? Yeah. Should be like PPC update though, so it will merge if you can, and if you can't, go to restart and not get that moment. That would be the easy solution. So the answer was do something like etc update does, where it'll try, and if it can't, it tells you to go resolve it by hand. We could probably do that in package now and just add some language that says at the end, here's the list of what failed. Yeah, and you can have a package comp for how long, or like a package comp status. So it'll be like, what if you have to go to the name of status and resolve? Yeah, so having a package comp status that just tells you at the end, here's what didn't merge cleanly. And then Maybe what also merged cleanly. It's like comp resolve within steps. Really, it's like when you have to have a resolve, it's like when you have some conflict, you can merge the bigger prompt. So mm -hmm. you how do you want to handle it versus resolve it one time? Yeah. So I think that would be a fantastic solution. I don't know if anyone's actively working on that in PKG. Or am I going to go to one on this one? Yeah, thumbs up. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> fine, fine. I, it it needs, popular, it be yeah, it's something we need to solve. I know it needs to be done before we can really adopt package base as a community. So you know we're willing to take the lead on it. But I'd just like some input before we go and code a thing up to make sure it uh, catches all the edge cases, because again, our specific needs are not necessarily the same as everyone else's. Um, tooling to handle upgrades. This is where it gets fun. What if you have ABI changes? You know, or free has update, or free BSD update, excuse me. Does the kernel first, reboot, finish up the update, etc. How are we gonna handle that within PKG? This is still somewhat of an open question. So I'll mention this in TrueNAS and FreeNAS. We handle this, we have a tool internal to us written in Go, which does package operations inside clean ZFS boot environments. That's our workflow, that's our use case. Works fantastic, highly recommend you try it if, if you want it, it's a neat little Go, Go tool. But that's probably not ideal for FreeBSD, uh, obviously. You need to support UFS on the FreeBSD side. So that's another one I think we're, we're willing to help try and solve, but I don't know if folks have opinions on how we solve that from the FreeBSD side. Or is, is any thought, you know, Brad, if anyone's thought about how we would tackle this on the PKG side? Yeah, we're, uh, there was work to do a, uh, like a post install, install script that would bail out and tell the user reboot now and then just like FreeBSD. So basically update the kernel first, reboot now, and then yeah. bail. For other things that cannot work, fast. Folks with patches talk about how to do that, and we might end up doing some kind of uh, package priorities, mm -hmm. uh, to just uh, beta data, etc. And the kernel will be always uh, updated. Update so first. we more or less did that in our tool. We cheated and just forcibly checked if it was a kernel update first, yeah. updated that, rebooted, and then said let's do the second stage as well. Yeah. Um, so Juno's packages are nothing like. Um, uh, one of the key differences is, is our packages basically contain an ISO containing all the files and made up of similar uh, content. Hmm. But what that means is uh, if, we're, if we're doing an upgrade or if we're installing a package that requires a reboot to install, uh, we've taught the loader to be able to go and look at you know, a package set so we can have multiple sets of packages installed at the same time. Hmm. So the active set is the one that you normally boot from if you're in the scenario that you're talking about, you create what we call a pending set, right. and you just dump everything in there like it, like normal, and when you boot, the loader will go look for the pending set first and try and boot it, and if it successfully mounts all those packages, it renames it to the active set, and you bring it up as a yeah. and the solution. It's, it's, it's morally equivalent to what you're doing in ZFS. With boot environments. environments. Yeah. But, yeah. But, it, but it doesn't tie you to any particular any file system over yeah. any other. Um, Interesting any idea. So all, all packages that require a reboot, you know, have a, have a tag in them to say, hey, I need a reboot to install. How would that work in the previous C world where they're not just saying an ISO, for example, and you install a bunch of individual packages that presumably have to get installed somewhere? You, you don't, the, the ISOs don't matter that much. Huh? Um, it just means you'd have probably more file system IO involved during your activation of packages. Mm -hmm. 
the package, it could contain uh, reboots by like uh, Microsoft does with the sure. MMS updates, right? Whereas uh, where you have a reboot required, yes, no, or maybe. So I'm not sure what they mean by maybe, but yeah, I guess so it might maybe. Be. So could you repeat some of what you just said? Yeah. So the uh, for the feed. Thing. Yeah. So for the remote feed, they're talking about over at Junos how you guys handle more or less distribute an ISO image, if you will, with all the packages extracted at that point. Uh, no, no. So each so we we current Junos uh, our minimum install is probably somewhere around 30, 40 packages. Okay. So about 30, 40 packages minimal install. Yeah, most of those packages consist of little more than an XML file that describes the package and an ISO file system image. So, okay. so you I, still, when, you, when you install the package, you just basically register it as an install. And when we go to mount the package, we mount the ISO. Uh, we potentially create some links in the, in the normal file system to point sure. files in the ISO. Okay. So the package system is more or less an XML with an ISO tree included there, and you update the package, it just points, we changes the sim links on the live system saying we're pointing to this image now. If well, you know, yeah. package. So uh, again, this is this is aimed squarely at embedded systems where right. you're typically using flash or SSD, so you want to minimize write cycles. Of course. Um, so the sim links don't actually point to the files in the, there, there's a bit of indirection involved, so mm -hmm. you can avoid updating the sim links. So, I can replace a package, none of the sim links need to be updated unless the content of the, pack, the package has been rearranged or something. So, if you have stale sim links, you, you fix those. So, hmm. the, the goal is to minimize file system. Of course, that makes sense in an embedded solution. Awesome. Wait, sorry, somebody else has something? Oh, I was saying, I can't imagine that would work for embedded solutions. Yeah, no, it's, it's not I don't know how we would. But if you, if you were doing, if you would achieve much the same goal, if you, instead of the ISO, you just had a tarball that you wanted to have that, that activation. How would you do that on UFS, though? Yeah, but the sibling form, we're, we're not going to turn our... No, you would skip the whole sibling form. form. But you could have a feed. You have two images that form the feed. Yeah, you'd still need, like, a... One, and you set the other one as bootloader node to choose the other one. Yeah, you'd have to go nano BSD style that way and have your two boot devices, if you will, and update the passive and reboot into it. Yeah, Correct. we currently manage to do it all in a single file system, but... Yeah. Sorry, somebody remote. Yeah, uh, Chris, just fine. How are you doing? Hey, good. Hey, uh, so uh, you guys are getting a little bit off topic of something I wanted to chime in on. Sure. Uh, so before you get too far down that rabbit hole, I just wanted to chime in real quick on something. Uh, regarding specifically uh, upgrading the kernel versus upgrading the user land, uh, one thing that one thing I did uh, a while back was requiring uh, making the kernel a dependency package of uh, of the, uh, the C lib or uh, I forget what the exactly it's called now, right. uh, but a, a dependency of that main runtime package that that is dependent by everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the the problem came up where if you do a package install into like create a jail for example, um, the problem was that you would end up getting a uh, a kernel installed into a jail, uh, which is, yeah. was unexpected and quickly pointed out to me that that can potentially be problematic. Uh, for example, running a i three d six kernel i three d six jail user land within a uh, AB sixty four uh, host system. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that up that that, that was uh, looked into, and I, I still don't have a good solution for it. Uh, I ended up referring that to it because of the implications of having uh, potentially a kernel within a jail that is mismatched from the host. Yeah, we didn't introduce that dependency into our user land. Kernel is not a dependency of user land specifically for the jail use case you're talking about here so but we do independently update the kernel via our external updater should it be installed yeah I mean one of the things we looked at before that some of that's already in package is making the user land packages depend on the running kernel being at least the API mm -hmm. uh, and so that those packages won't install until you've rebooted on the new kernel do you know if package ever got that uh, or was that pack package now at least does somewhat, like if you try to install the 
12 table packages on a 12 o is like, hey, the ABI doesn't match. Yeah, the it'll definitely check the ABI. I don't think it goes quite as right. It doesn't go as detailed. far as saying this package won't install an x 76 ABI, but it mm -hmm. might be, you know, a, a way to go forward there. Yeah, I'm gonna have to visit that again and see. It, it still has you do things like run an 11 user land on at jail on 13. Mm -hmm. Is you can't run something newer than the current. Do you need to enforce that for jails, though? For example, our well, system. For jails, it's just, like it's in, uh, in general, we don't want to install packages that are new in the kernel. Of course, we'll have some way to overwrite it. Sure. One of us will want to do something silly at some point. Yeah, yeah, of course. So right now, we'll do we'll do a package install dash r, create a jail. We set set a different ABI. For example, if we want a load eleven on twelve. Yeah. For the for the jail function, you can't just tag the kernel package saying I can't be installed in jail. So. You just allow everything to behave normally, but the kernel package says you have to do it We could, or do we have to go that far? Is it required that we allows you to have the dependency that the particular chapters? Sure. Which is I mean, right. The problem there is you don't always like you're. You could be creating the image for a jail while not in a jail, and things like that. But, but I'm it saying the problem with the upgrade. The, the package system. The package system. It, you, you have tags in the packages, and the package system. Hey, I know I'm installing into a jail, I don't care where you built it. Mm -hmm. And the package will say, I don't get installed in jail, so leave me out. Well, you have to figure out how you do dependency resolution and things that normally depends on that package. So you yeah. user land is Yeah, so you, for kernel. instance, your main runtime thing can say, hey, I depend on either the kernel package being there or being in a jail. Right, so it's, yeah, so it's, it's actually on the dependent package, or it's on the dependent package, not on the so, provider. Right, what I'm gathering from this is you guys feel there should be a dependency on the kernel from user land. We do not have one right now, purposely. So for exactly this reason, we instead, during the installer, choose to install user land and kernel as separate packages, both with the vital flag set. And then our updater will make sure, oh, there's a kernel installed. Let me helpfully update that for you first before we do the rest. Yeah. Well, I like the idea of this. So, you know, I, mean, I was just trying to make an awkward dumb suggestion. All right. So there is, in fact, a range of kernels that could satisfy this dependency. Correct. There's a missing. Loop still missing, of course, the package feature, or being able to have multiple different things supply a dependency. Mm -hmm. and yeah. For jail, you could choose to have a package which was a fake kernel that just satisfies yeah. the dependency. Sure. Sure. I, I was going to say, in our package system, we have a, you know, a, 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 a provide require thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a kernel, the kernel package, which happens to be 64 bit, you know, he provides a 64 bit kernel. Um, when you install the Unpack 32 thing, it says, you know, I provide a 32 bit quote kernel. Sure. So anything that's saying, hey, I need a 32-bit kernel is satisfied by having the compact 32 stuff present. Okay. Brian, thoughts on that? Uh, I'm pretty sure that the dependency syntax is in TKG, if it's not deployed. Yeah. Okay. So nothing is it. Okay. So I mean, if you're rolling your own package in the series, you could you provide required. Okay. Yeah. So we need to expose that to the port stream. That means touching MKA, and people get all cranky when I do that. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> willing to. Yeah. What was that? Did you just put it directly in the keyless box? Uh, does that go in the keyless or is that in the manifest itself? Yeah. Yeah, that, that ends up in MKA in the scripts directory where we generate the manifest. That's where I have a patch to add vital flag right now. Have fun, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. We appreciate it. My idea of just using an integer uh, looks better now, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> 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 you just need yeah, 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 something that, from the environment, you said provides kernel ABI version one or whatever. Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily that come from a package. It could just be whatever it is. Kernel environment stuff. You just read. So what's the objection with just not having the kernel dependency on user land? Again, just throwing it out there. Is it so critical that when I PKG install user land, I have to have a kernel with it? Well. So you want to install kernel modules that match your kernel. Yeah, in our use case, it would be we would like to replace the standard uh, FreeBSD kernel with our own one. Mm -hmm. So we have our own user net packages which depend on our version of the kernel sure. with our extension. But if you have if you're building your own images and you have an installer, can't you just tell the installer and install ours? Well, wouldn't in, in that case you just have a flavor? You just well, create a flavor and say here's all our bit, all our bits. Maybe, maybe, yeah. yeah. So, ha having a fully expressed dependency graph mm -hmm. makes it a lot easier to avoid shooting yourself in the foot. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, good thought.
costs also. Right, so we have to build that. Versus yeah, there's some tooling. Simple safety on the foot gun that doesn't let you uh, install a new user land that won't work in your kernel unless you say, yes, I really shoot myself in the foot. Yeah, I know. I'm doing something dangerous. Much smaller kill point. Hmm. See, the kernel depends on libc, and libc depends on the kernel. I don't think you would have to have that dependency on the kernel on libc. You go the other way around. Like with my gun, it would be don't install a newer libc until you're running the newer kernel. Mm -hmm. Unless you say, I'm willing to deal no. with that. Yeah. No, even if you're building something in a. I mean, so what you're saying is we need a dash the oldo flag. Well, yeah, yeah, there's a flag for when you want to install a friendly flag. It's a or an upgraded system. You don't necessarily worry too much about whether it's yeah, it's actually backwards. So you, can go go there. And you can always go back to moving on. You haven't done so. Hmm. I, I do it the other way around. I snapshot the working system and then overwrite it with the new version. It's the yeah, same thing. Kind of what I meant, but you can right. build an entire boot environment with new kernel and new packages yeah. before you even bother booting it up because you know that you've got a backup path up yeah. to the normal UFS operation. Which is great for ZFS, but then when you know. Are you guys envisioning use cases where on the base, again, leaving jail aside for a moment, where on the base you are expecting to upgrade or change kernels um, out of lockstep with user land? You just arbitrarily want to build a new thing and run with a different user land? Because in our use case, on the true OS Freenet side, it's shipped as a bundle. You get a build, it's in one repo, PKG upgrade, you can upgrade both together, always. I think as a developer, you want to do that, but as an end user, I'm not sure. I mean, Most end users, I think, would want to just uh, buy it up to the app. Yeah. Well, the only case, like, the only reason I'm envisioning not letting you install the new user land until you boot it to the kernel is the cases where, you know, you've installed, if you install the new user land and the new kernel but haven't rebooted yet, now you have a user land where top won't run because mm -hmm. some system PL doesn't exist and PS doesn't work and maybe the reboot command doesn't work. Sure, uh, sure. And then how Done. Better hope your IP and my are set up. Yeah. Why would I call them both? Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. I mean, to some extent, to some extent, is this kind of like, from the way you're saying, like, is this really that much of an issue? Because, especially if we really, I guess the question is, what is the audience really target for this feature? If well, that's. If we're targeting release, release oriented users, mm -hmm. then it doesn't. <clears throat> Frankly, it probably doesn't matter, right? Well, I guess as long as there's, you know, unless you're running a major upgrade, mm -hmm. in which case then well, I think that there needs to be a upgraded kernel reboot and maybe the rest of the world, right? At yeah. that point, you know, as a development system point of view. But honestly, for uh, we actually do a pretty good job of not breaking our APIs to the point where like if you install the kernel and the user land at the same time and then just reboot it, you know what? It's gonna work. Yeah. For I, the most part, that's that true. Been previous the update on minor updates. Yeah, for the most part, that's true. We Our builds on Shiraz are on head, so things are always breaking, which is fun. Um, but there's no yeah. contract. I, right? yeah. We have a contract on the, on the, yeah. On the state direction. Yeah. yeah. So there are some aspects of the same. So, cool. I'd love to go, before you continue, I've got a quick comment. Yeah. Um, and I think, I, I think this is important enough to bring up, and I think it's important enough to uh, bring up in the context of why uh, in in source, there are so many packages versus your implementation, which is like three or four. Um, regarding eight or nine, uh, yeah. ABI breakthroughs and so on, uh, that's part of why there's that that CLIPS package mm -hmm. uh, to make sure LDL, uh, as as uh, as Kostic mentioned in his reply uh, to your call for testing, um, the, the the C runtime emit then SH. Um, all of that stuff is updated first. Uh, that, that like that is a core dependency of every other package. All of that is updated first uh, in order to prevent <laughs> anything from going sideways as, uh, as a result of you know, potential parallelism with uh, packages internals or something to that effect. Um, so before you go too far from where you are, where you're at now in your discussion. Uh, I wanted to bring that up because that was an intentional design decision okay. because of the implications it could have. Of, like, in case something does happen. So when you let, 
we need to basically break user land base up and have a small Git package, if you will, or something, yeah. or a bootstrap. Yeah. Just the stuff so that if you're, when you're overriding the running system, that the later packages won't, yeah. especially if they have any code install script, they don't have to run. That's right. Control C really hurts. Right. And the, <laughs> one of the other things I want to mention regarding the, the difference in, in the number of packages between uh, TrueOS and, and the in source uh, packaging system um, that I think is important enough to bring up because, I, because it may be an oversight. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not saying that. In, in you know any nefarious way, um, the fetching a 700 megabyte package when I'm updating a Raspberry Pi 3, for example, uh, can be extremely painful when it comes down to updating the package and extracting. You know, downloading it is, is one thing, um, but sure. extracting a 700 megabyte package for a you know for uh, for Raspberry Pi. Or you know, whatever ARM board it is, uh, is extremely painful when it comes to SD cards and the update time when with using uh, the in, in source version of uh, packaging base, it, an update would maybe take you know 20 megabytes at best. Uh, the extract time is very minimal, and regardless of where you're depending on what's being updated. Uh, I think that's important enough to bring up in context of uh, of this discussion at this point. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention that before I, before I it slipped my mind. Yeah. I just want to make a, another comment on the, on the push shooting thing. Um, so we've, we've basically been shipping a package-based FreeBSD-like system for nearly 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and if you leave any Of course. Um, we used to get, before we had our new package system, we used to get at least one bug file per year where somebody had done an upgrade install, ignored all the warnings about you need to reboot now, um, come back from lunch and found that they were being timed out, so they logged out of the system and they can't log in anymore because now the user lane and kernel is out of yeah. So it's really important if you want to have a supportable system to make it impossible for people to shoot yourself. Yeah. So we enforce that at a different level within FreeNAS. We're just going to automatically reboot when the update takes place to boot in a new boot environment. So we catch a lot of sins through that process, but that doesn't, again, directly apply to a FreeBSD user who might do things a little bit more manually. So I know we're currently calling it reboot. We may want to try to make sure we're as low level as possible. Sure. So we're not relying on outside binaries. Uh, we call reboot from the uh, original boot environment right now. So it's not. Oh, yeah, that's not when you make your data. Uh, we can ZFS lets us do a lot of nice yeah. stuff, yeah. <laughs> so we can get away with a lot more. But you could actually have a flag similar to your vital flag, mm -hmm. in that um, when that flag is set, even if the user doesn't want to reboot, you're going to reboot. Sure. And you're going to like it. Yeah, it's going to happen as part of the process. Our system updater just tells you it's going to reboot at the end. Yeah. Yeah. That's and just you got to no say about it. Yep. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's okay to, to give people flags so they can say, yes, go ahead, reboot when you finish the install. But if you have a situation where you need them to provide that sort of flag and they don't, mm -hmm. you feel better off to fail the install saying, I can't do this unless you give me permission to reboot. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Uh, good. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to what Glenn was starting yes. to say. Uh, so, so, number of packages might look big, but uh, if you take, for example, uh, if 12.0 was shipped with PKG based, um, for 12.0-P1, that would only have updated two packages, I think, mm -hmm. and it's less like than uh, one meg, I think. So the, the update process would be very quick, etc. Sure. Uh, usually you don't, uh, I know that's, how people have used PKG base, and I think it's the way you use PKG base, that you always reboot every package, and so you always update seven, eight hundred packages. But that's not how PKG base was mm -hmm. uh, viewed. What you need to do to properly use PKG base is you choose a date, you bootstrap the packages for the release, um, 
drop that the relay branch, you build the package, you diff them, mm -hmm. and you just copy over the package address that have changed. Yeah, with Delta. And yeah, and, and you're only doing, uh, you only fetch the whole set of package when you update to a minor version because uh, between, for example, 12.0 and what's actually uh, uh, club stable, mm -hmm. almost everything has changed, so yeah. every package will be updated. But on daily basis to handle just uh, security patches, uh, you just update one or two packages. Mm -hmm. and, and I would like to say that we had an automated variant of that towards the end of us using our package base, where it only used that. And the other thing I'd like to mention, just to be clear, there's 795 packages, and I could have put the number before, but the important thing is a lot of those are literally empty. I went When we went to do the ZFS and Linux stuff, and I'm not hitting on the people that did the work. Mm -hmm. I just want to make it clear to everyone that, like, I went to go, we went to go to the ZFS on Linux package. I went, oh, great. We can just not install the ZFS package, install the ZFS on Linux package. We don't have to do anything with that slide. I went into the package, and it was empty, along with a lot of other ones. So looking at the work still to be done there, I just want to point that out. That was where it got complicated. We started sending different width without flags as well. You mean you didn't install any files? Yeah. But it had dependencies on the interface. No. It had, it had metadata saying I exist. Which package was it? ZFS. As well as the installer. We encourage them to maintain a list of changing packages and things that need to be So, and I also want to say that there's actually nothing about the new build system to Air that says that we can't build out manifests and do as many packages as we want. These are actually two orthogonal problems where if right. I've chosen to break it into, a, you know, break it into just these five, but that is really up for debate with the additional, the, the method this is being done yeah. through integration. Through Basically, here. splitting it into more packages is relatively trivial. Just copying a couple ports and changing which files are getting packaged. Um, we could go down that rabbit hole as far as we need to, as makes sense. I mean, if we wanted to split out kind of a base bootstrap, easy peasy. Yeah, a lot of the base packages are like profile libraries or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we started by splitting out the obvious ones, debug, docs, tests, symbols, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I confirmed that the ZFS package is empty, I will look at that. <laughs> yeah, it, it happened just a few times. I'm, I'm not saying it's all of them. I, don't, I didn't look at the number under the same. It's only ETC ZFS. So it might depend on if you have an export file there or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. There's a different approach to it. Uh, and I've seen people have problems with PKG's conflict system. So, mm -hmm. should we have like just a new package base dash p1 that just contains the files that change in the security update? No. So mm -hmm. we still have the one big base package, package and then we just overwrote it that was file. Yeah, what what is delta, uh, delta packages? Yeah. And yeah. Well, so the, the delta package, package with today. The delta package helps you not download as much, but you still end yeah. up with having to reconstruct the whole package rather than just having. You know, yeah, it's a package that's been published. A package can be like installed as part of the file system. So all you need to do is update some metadata and have the database. Like as you play the file. Yeah. Hmm. But then you're that's more complicated than just having a package that contains the seven files and never write that. But then you do have to deal with cleaning it up when you upgrade versions and so on. Like, yeah. And it doesn't get to check the other things are okay and then you can new file checks, right? So so one of the big differences that I want to have some discussion about is in tree versus out of tree. Obviously, we have our reasons for wanting it out of tree, so that we can iterate, we can do things. We're not tied to painful merges back to stable a year from now when package base finally grows some feature that we need or want. Yes. Um, I I personally would like to see some artifact in the tree mm -hmm. because you know that that gives me a hook to start replacing build world and so on with a much nicer build system. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, um, I, I mean, I, I definitely understand in your use case um, why out of tree makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. and especially while it's undergoing um, sort of rapid development, you want to be able to build like your FreeBSD 11 base sure. thing or whatever, right? Um, continuously without having to keep cherry picking those mm -hmm. in. I think once stuff starts getting upstream, um, we definitely want to have something in the same repo that gets um, like 
Uh, I would disagree with that. I think you guys are going to reach a point if you continue going down that route where you're going to ship 13, for example, and at some point go, ah, crap, we needed to have this in package base. Well, mess the boat, everyone suffer for a while. If you do that, or cherry pick back a lot of change. Well, no, I mean, I, I think um, you know, if there's stuff that needs to get fixed in 12, mm -hmm. we just we, we need to backwards it. Um, we need to cherry pick it, right? Because the the, the problem is then um, like we, we inherently have that issue anyway. If we need to fix, if we need to re you know release, we had 12.0. We need to release 12.1. Um, we we still need to we we would need to tag the, the separate repo there with this is the um, the, the out of tree package based building stuff sure. that we use for 12 anyway. We'd have to ha have a different branch of that mm -hmm. anyway, right? Um, so wouldn't you just have version packages like you know you have OSC running 12.1? Yeah. Oh, that's how we would do it. Like, we just tag it as a port. Yeah, whatever it is, you just tag it as a port. Like, yeah, so you're just doing for everything else. Yeah, the only thing that's different is just which source you're going to go. Yeah, which, which hash are you pulling off of yeah. subversion or maybe get soon? You're centralizing release engineering work. Yeah. So, I to be clear, I am not advocating that anybody contemplate using our package system or anything like that. I'm just, I'm just trying to point out some lessons that we've learned over 20 years. Um, one of the things that we did with the, our latest version of this thing was we tried very hard to remove any um, hard-coded interaction between a quote release and the actual version of the package um, so that you, eventually you want to get to a point where whether you're running 12, 1, 12, 2, or whatever, many of the component packages may or should be identical. Um, and so you, you make that notion of a release a, um, what's the word, um, independent of, of the package system. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just a, um, a, a logical association rather than something that can be burned into the packages. Well, that's, a, that's similar to what Red Hat and IBM do. So sure. uh, Red Hat uh, a release with whatever slash etc red hat release contains and what you know the package name is and, I, and uh, when i worked on the ibm mainframe the uh, uh, release didn't really matter all it was was a, a five five byte string that was stored in a kernel somewhere and it could be anything you know here we kind of do that on three has etsy yeah. etsy version is really yeah, what so, it is and the package is just arbitrary so any user could or any person could put whatever string they wanted in there, and mm -hmm. it would be anything. So your, your release is really a collection of packages that yeah. are in that bundle on that tape. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, any other discussion points around this? Has anybody seen or looked at flavors yet? How would you do that in base or out of base? Out of base really easy. Forks does it already. We just adapted it to do that. Our flavor is a big thing we need for base packages, I guess. Is that yeah. still a big want? Yes. I, yeah. I think something. Okay. All right. Michael Lucas says yes. We need flavors, so let it be done. <laughs> I think something that wasn't that may or may not have been made clear through all this is that when you're looking at your source of proof of what is my OS, my kernel, my packages, and all this stuff comes in, in this system, it comes down to a tag of the port tree. Um, so the port tree fully explains this kernel, this user land, you know, all of those details, um, and just uh, and maybe people got that. I just wanted to make sure. It's the OS it source package is really the only package that matters. You point that at whatever source you're going to build and let Poudreau do its thing. Yeah. So you're saying the tag should really be in sync with each other. Well, what I'm saying is that if you have the tag of the port tree, yeah. that's the tag of everything else. That The port tree has all the other tags. Yeah. There's um, no there's reason that the source for the port couldn't be stashed in the OS source of it and sucked in by Poudreau. But then, but then you go back to not having a single tag that, that explains it all. Sure. Well, people like to think about single tags, but in reality, any 
any software packaging system that I've seen over the last n number of years. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, 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 the version number that is associated with the operating system is totally meaningless. Well, when I say single tag, I, I mean, if we want to build 12.0 release with the original set of packages, we need to feed a single tag into yeah. a build system and get that out, because that's very important. And, and that, that single tag is important to human beings only. It's not really important to... Well, it's important to reproducibility. I want to be able to say I can build the same build you're building. Yeah, but you can have a meta tag that represents this tag in this repo, this tag in this repo. Well, but, but our meta tag is just a tag of the port tree, so the port tree represents all the other tags. Mm -hmm. Right, but what if I don't have the ability to tag the port tree? Anybody can have a port tree. So, yeah, okay, you're not talking about a tag in the, re in the SCN. For the top level, and if you want to build the exact thing 3VSD is doing, then you use the tag there, but if you're doing your own thing, then you, you know, so what are we talking? What do you mean by when you say tag? In this case, uh, it's you know I'm talking about GitHub tag, but it could be a revision. Yeah, it could be yeah, any arbitrary. You can print it based on Git. Well, no, 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 no. Mean, you can do an SEM tag that's local to your system. You have a revision mm -hmm. version. Mm -hmm. Tag is just a symbolic way of saying yeah. this. Is saying this is any, 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 any way of saying the port tree at this stage. Could be a GitHub tag or R number or anything. Or, or if it could be a disk file, it could be a tarball of the sources. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't really matter. It's a tarball of the you know, port tree, and, and you're not affected the repo that you're yeah. returning. It's just a name. So yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. <coughs> okay. <sighs> Why not? Let's set it up. So this one I just went ahead and set up. This is uh, 12, FreeBSD 12 we set up with ZFS on Linux as a flavor. I selected it right at the beginning of the installation. And nothing exciting here. Everyone's seen this dollar a million times, I'm sure. Oh, thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions or thoughts or? Yeah. What does ZFS on Linux mean? So, so we <laughs> <laughs> ZFS on Linux FreeBSD now, well, or formerly known as? Perfect. 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 Yeah, let me let me encapsulate that in a nutshell. So, new source of truth for ZFS. Yes. So we're using this as proof of concept because we want to rapidly iterate on this ZFS on Linux for new source of truth, bringing it to FreeBSD. We're doing it internally at IX to FreeNAS and TrueNAS. We want it badly. We need it. And um, with package base, we just spun up a flavor. So flavor just by default turns off ZFS in FreeBSD and says bring in the ports version of ZFS on Linux and we use that in place of uh, what's currently in tree. To, so. to help with this situation, what's their patching to make that version of OpenZFS work on FreeBSD get upstream, hopefully, what, in months or so? Yeah. Uh, that repo will be renamed to just OpenZFS and the word Linux won't appear in the name anymore. Yes, yes. Well, finally, we'll have the true multi platform yeah. file system we've all wanted. You can run it on Windows, OS X, Linux, BSD. I will never use XFAT on a USB stick again. I'll just throw ZFS on it. Hey, is the crypto set up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so when are you adding uh, VFS to your five? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe he doesn't speak open ZFS yet. <laughs> so in this case, what we have here is I've just done the ZFS on Linux flavor. Again, just a choice during installation. You'll see here we have our ZFS flavor user lane, which in turn has injected dependencies on the ACs or just support options. 
Another thing I'll mention we did with the ports is since you can now build world and turn a lot of ports, you can run make config and all the knobs are just exposed automatically and you get the nice graphical installer where you can go through and select what things you want to build with. So I'm trying to deliver some of the ports, ports niceties here to make this a little easier for us. Yes? So, so I guess I look at this and say I don't see any reason why we wouldn't go this method where it's out of tree. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, all the other developers are going to the idea of us making one of your CD short term filter. Yeah. John's shaking his head behind you pretty vigorously. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I guess the question is, Eric, how do you turn this into your development environment? How how would we work this up for our developer community to say, you know what, guys, it's time for a change. Mm -hmm. and this is how we do it, like to get us out of you know, a, a, a all right. like shift where all of a sudden, actually, guess what, guys? Our ports tree is now the operating system. And the base that was in the center source is actually just another part that is shipped. And then we get to do all sorts of fun stuff like, guess what, guys? We don't have to be made LLVM anymore because we can just use the. Yeah, you just do LLVM. And LLVM. And just that. Go ahead, John. I wanted to the CLI set up so we daily little packages and stuff like I don't understand like, any downsides here to, to doing it in the board. Making some will bring go away. Like, yeah, it's something we use as part of our build. And like, when you build, you pack on something. Well, Maybe like, some will just part of uh, I mean, strictly This different. is effectively wrapping around this problem. It doesn't mean you can't not use it anymore. You can choose. Like, right. You're not forced into using it. And Oftentimes, when you're when you're hacking on software, if there are things that you're using off the shelf, you might go for some nice package or some service. The thing you're actually hacking on, you actually want to like have some sort of things you can build in directly. So, yeah. um, so like I view this as a much more like the package wrapping is much more useful for production environment stuff. So I'm not necessarily like for developers who are actually hacking on the bits that you're using yourself. I think it's fine to start with the source stuff. Yeah, you could still I can imagine people this still install kernel, build no kernel, and screw around. I mean, like packaging up and delivering the bits to like production environment for their users, but for developer, they can deal with something that's more important. I guess if sorry, I know your hands up. No. I guess at that point, is there a way you could hook after the build world to like then then hook into the ports? Like I could do my own build world, but then have use the framework to still do packages as part of the install world. You can do, Possibly. but I think the better thing that we already have, right, because it's pretty me, you can just have your source locally get pulled in when you do make. Pulled. Not even get pulled. If you have I mean, not pulled, pulled check that source, the port yeah, tree. I've added a hook that says if you have this environment variable set for your local source destination, it'll go there, build that, package it up for you, never even check anything out at all. So we just make fetch entirely. So in the case, you could make your build world then just invoke that installer. Sure. If you're using Quarterly, you can do all of it. Then you create a jail, right? And you can put it in a source tree and a port tree, and it will create that jail from that source tree you pointed at. Yeah. And, do all and you get really nice stuff, like you get, you might get, you know, for when you're building inside of it, you'll all of a sudden get your log say. You'll get your build time reported as long as it's not the first iteration when you ask about the jail itself. Oh, those we'll logs, those logs are kept too. Oh, well, you don't, you don't get build time that doesn't end up in the free UI right now. Yeah, yeah. Can I, I can, live with can I bring uh, something back from earlier that I just kind of realized thinking about all this? Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no re so package already for every manifest holds all the checksum. There's absolutely no reason why we can't tell package to do a package check first. And don't extract it to check that hasn't changed on an individual file. Which means that we're not blowing up the rights on a disk. If a file hasn't changed, yeah, you don't have to delete the same thing. And then again, just exactly. They already do that, actually. It just doesn't. Package perhaps you three wrote it last Okay. Year. And so we don't extract things. Yeah, so so you're wasting TPU cycles, but you're not wasting AMP cycles. I just Oh, that's good to know. I wasn't aware. Of yeah, I wasn't aware of that either. So thank you. I just wanted to. I don't know if it's in the release. Of oh, <laughs> I see. I see how it is now. You don't have it really yet. <laughs> it's, in, it's in Git. Like, it's, why? it's somewhere. So why not? Why, just it open broken? <laughs> why not just download only the changes? Like what's? Yeah, at that point we would want to go to Delta packages. Like, like Delta RPM. 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that, that, that would be the next logical step for us. I think that's the real answer rather than sitting here saying, oh, we need to somehow, like, break down and, like, why don't you just, like, the next step is get it. I'm sure that would be happy to see your question. Yes. Now, again, how like it's not not. Oh, might be something we work on. That's a deal breaker. It's like we need to get this fit our use case specifically, but it's something I feel our value with. And and delta delta packets make a lot of sense on stable, and if that's the only reason why, but I guess my. Disconnect with delta packages is how do you scale enough resources to figure all of the deltas when you have something going faster? You, I guess you don't, but is that, is that the answer? You have to choose how many deltas you're going to do. Well, yeah, I mean, we already make that decision now, actually. As part of like, the, 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 the update, so when we go and generate like, new releases, we decide what we're going to make that. It's not everything. I get to say, oh, from the last two RCs, the last beta, and the previous beta, and then that's it. Okay. That's, that's the extent of the data, or the extent of the delta. Can you show an example of how to build packages and check out things? Uh, I don't have anything set up on the laptop at the moment. And of course, I don't have any that set up. Um, another nice thing is all the make flags get reported in TKU, which is fantastic. I love that. Very great. <laughs> Can you show that? I don't think I have any of the packages installed. I was going to install the build package. And the keyboard repeat on just sucks. It is it's so exuberant. So you can see these are the these are the options I've added for the user land meta package of ZOL. Is, uh, I don't know. Oh, actually, I was going to say it's not set to on there. I need to go check on <laughs> I'm clearly running it, but I'm going to see why that didn't translate over. All right. Any other comments or questions? I have a little bit of time still. So. Is there any impediment to putting it into the board screen? So, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So, there's a patch for Food Rear, which will make this easier for you to use. Uh, there's two patches for the MK tree, or for the MK directory and the forks tree. One of them adds the vital flag, which we need so we can set user land and kernel to vital. Uh, there's another one in MK scripts where we create the manifest, I believe it is. It's a minor one, but it's a little bit of a trick for Poodrier builds specifically. So when we build a meta package of user land, we don't want it to go and try and package and install user land base as a dependency inside the jail already because that's read only and bad things happen. So there's a little bit of a trick there to say, oh, skip that at the base package. It satisfies the dependency, keep on moving. Um, aside from that, it's just a directory in the forks tree with, with the forks at that point, just an OS directory. Uh, we've written a tool which we run periodically via Jenkins, which goes and updates the tag of the fork automatically to the latest GitHub cache in our tree. Um, but you can, of course, modify it any way you'd like using normal port conventions as well. So you can manually or automatically change it as well. I'll be happy to provide more documentation on that. I did have, let's see here, for those who haven't seen it yet, I think I have the link here. Oh, really quick, the special thanks. So uh, Ken Ward IX helped a lot with this. Joe Maloney, who's in the back there, has helped a lot. Should put your name on here. I apologize for that, Nick. He's beat it up a lot and got the arm builds working, which was fun. Building. Building, Building. yes. <laughs> and then uh, the MeWe oh, bot okay. has been helping us out too. Basically, every time we broke something, he would let us know. <laughs> and to, actually, Chris, uh, yeah. multiple don't start just patches, but at least the um, uh, food rear and vitals are either pull requests or reviews, or maybe more than that. Correct? Yeah, the food rear one is a pull request into the food rear repo. The vital is in fabricator right now, waiting for review. And once we get through that, we can uh, submit the other one for a review as well. I split them up and just haven't done the second half yet. Um, there's a bunch of information online here. We kind of set up an FAQ style page with a bunch of info about what we've done here. We've set it up for by default to rebuild two kernels. Um, just automatically, those are the ports we ship. So you end up with your debug and no debug variants, and you can install both at the same time and get runtime, choose which one you want to boot. That was important for us for FreeNAS, but uh, you can change it or add more or not build that one if you don't want. Let's see. Uh, information on how to change flavors. This was a fun one. So, as I've mentioned in some of the posts around the interwebs, 
Do not use package install to try and forcibly gain day of labor. This will screw up your day because it will helpfully remove your old install base and delete, up, delete all your comp files in the process before it installs a new one. So the workaround for that, which I don't know if you guys can see that here. Let's zoom in a little. <laughs> Package set is really handy, and we're probably using it in ways this wasn't intended for, but it works. So you can just go ahead and change the name of whatever flavor you're running to the flavor you want to go to, and at that point, run your normal PKG upgrade, and it'll just seamlessly go, oh, let me update to the new one, and it'll keep your comp files intact. So a little bit of a trick. I'd like a cleaner way to do that going forward, but it works for the time being. I don't know if anyone has other, that was something I had asked if anyone knows of other ways to do this or if I stumbled across the only one. This is um, a hack from a long time back, this is Raspberry Pi. What was that? Uh, it's a hack from a long time back, this is Raspberry Pi. Okay, for upgrading for all the way back. Well, it's still very helpful now, it turns out. That was for changing the origin. Well, there's one for origin, but name is what we care about in this case because the origin is the same, it's just a different flavor of that origin. So anyway, changing the name works great. And I have the little warning here about don't use package install. How to build. So really quick, this is what our entire build process looks like today. So we run Poudre ports. We check out our port tree. If anybody's used Poudre, you should know that. This is the only real difference from your normal FreeBSD workflow today. We're going to go ahead and create a new JL. We're just going to say build the JL out of the base packages that are in ports. It'll look into the ports tree and go, great, I see an OS category, there's a source there, there's all the ports I need, and we bootstrap the JL for you, and done. At that point, you just run Poudre normally, and if you have other flavors to build, it'll do those as part of your normal package build. Great, at the end, you're ready to ship it. Any questions on that? No? Okay. So the ports make file or whatever for one of these packages points to which source we're going to check out. Right, so like, if I'm going to have a, an 11.2 and a 12.0, are there going to be two different packages in the... You, yeah, you'd have to create a different source package. At the moment, I have it set, we're using one for free nows, but we could create a different OS, source 11, source 12, source 13, and move it or toggle between them. Does it make more sense to actually treat them more like categories? Like, there's OS slash 13 dash current, and inside of that there's source, say, whatever the... Hey, I'm open to suggestions like that. That makes it easier to I will say it is much easier wrangling this as ports than it was going through and hunting through all the make files and build right. yeah. system. Like couple of the make files. Yeah. Like sure. We could totally do that. And then for Steve, this is a very talk about a lot. Uh, if we want to replace build world, make your build world build kernel, whatever, make world, make kernel. All that stuff is below this level, so that's kind of orthogonal. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah the, 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 the only trick was I was hoping that you know, the package based stuff would end up with a directory somewhere in the source tree that would, as a side effect of building that package, we could collect the data that would therefore be able to feed the build system for the next step. But if you don't do it in the source tree, then you can't collect that data. Yeah. It's more, it's more, I think, that we could eventually, if we wanted to, go the other way around. If the build system figures all the stuff, you could use that and you know, make the packages out of. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, we build all our packages in the source tree, but um, uh, yeah, you need a starting point. Yep. So I'm just grabbing my build kernel here. Again, if you want the tar wall, it is nice to have it available somewhere. Okay. That's the uh, compiled tarball of the entire kernel that we use to chunk up. Again, once we get sub packages, we may not need this anymore, but I do find it helpful from time to time just to be able to get a tarball. What was that? Is this laid out as installed or is it in user No, it puts it in user dist. There will be a kernel. Yeah. Right, the, the contents. Is it the contents of the auditor? Or the show us the oh, oh, yeah, sure. Well, fine, I'll show you. <clears throat> and thank you, keyboard. All right, there it is. One tarball. That's that's all that is. That's just a build artifact. And that's what I use to feed into other tools like IO Cage that can create a jail from. Uh, I wouldn't use the kernel. I use user land in that case. They can create a jail from a tarball. 
the content is like Dexter. Yes, it's the contents of Dexter, not the object tree. So we could package that up too if anybody wants all the objects. Well, that's uh, kind of what I was thinking about when uh, NetApp was talking about their system the other day. Is that you know, you can see like, give me a very recent object tree so I can do an incremental build one. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, Brooks. What was that? Uh, I do not today. We could grab that though. Yeah, those are suggestions. Yeah, we could separate that out and put it in the top level and toss it in the P list. Again, I'm a ports guy, so we can do lots of fun stuff with ports, you name it. Okay, no other questions? I would be using the upgrade from Grub to Supreme. So um, the way you would right now with other package base as well, you also set a different ABI flag just to say, yes, I know I'm doing something. I'm moving to the new kernel, do the kernel install reboot. Uh, I don't know if that's on our FAQ. It's uh, I've seen that info posted elsewhere for package base. It might even be on the package base wiki right now. And I could rip that off and put it in our FAQ if we need to, but the process is identical. It's just set a different ABI flag on the package command. So our updater does exactly that, actually. It's just behind the scenes saying, oh, great, we're going from 11 to 12, set the ABI flag, and go, it figures out what the remote ABI is as the new package is coming in. But, uh, yeah. Anything else? OK. So one, the one thing, yeah. really quick, one thing that just occurred to me, um, and you mentioned going from 11 to 12. And this is this is kind of the the train of thought I was in when I was making the uh, the kernel dependent or the, the user way dependent on the kernel package mm -hmm. uh, is something like uh, uh, I know sixty four for example is a perfect example uh, where you need things to be updated in a very specific order uh, you absolutely must you know install the kernel and reboot the board. Uh, upgrade the user and things like those. Uh, not necessarily when it comes to like updating from you know thirteen point zero to thirteen point one. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't expect it to be a very huge deal, uh, but the you know from eleven earlier or whatever to you know eleven to twelve or twelve to thirteen or you know whatever the whatever the path is. Um, that's that's where I think the uh, that's where I think figuring out. How to properly deal with the uh, the kernel being attacked is uh, uh, kind of important. Uh, yeah. Apologize for my dogs. So the way I'm thinking is you would add something probably to the kernel manifest directly that says I must be updated first before others and in place before others with a reboot. Is how I would you know if I had to go do it right now. This this may be heresy, but we also have the option, especially for major updates of Having a three and a half up or sorry, not three and a half, free BSD update that knows from 12 to 13, oh, we did these really weird things. We need to do this specific thing. Well, sure, you can use package on each other time, but there's also the safer way that we can actually embed into the port tree knowledge of anything specific we have to do because we did some major update and you know, store. That's what we're doing with our yeah. external now, is we're basically wrapping around package and saying, these are the things we know we have to do to do this safely, but I'm fine with moving more of that into PKG itself or into the ports framework to give more knowledge to package directly. You had a thought, John? I thought I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, I was thinking of a provide for part, which is providing version of API. I provide the previous to your website. If your kernel was provided, and it could even map to what the master needs to do off the API enabled to be able to sure. provide the previous for API. But that's still, that's still out of the top of the sales. Yeah. But, but maybe, you could do, maybe you could keep it from doing stupid things by not letting you package install something if you're running kernel package that doesn't provide the API. <coughs> that's a thought. Does package today when you upgrade from within the jail, does it have any awareness that it's jailed? It, it, 
both at whatever NFH AEI. No, that's fine, but I mean, does it realize I am in a jail? Yeah, it should be able to. It knows. It knows? Yeah, it okay. prints the host name as part of the progress thing and takes okay. up the whole web screen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But like, I think we can turn off most of the safety belts if you're using the dash R option if you're building an image offline. Like, you're not using package install, you're doing install dash R and you go over here, and it might not even be the same architecture as what you're running, and so you can turn the safety belts off if you're doing that. Okay. Yeah, just like a backup slide. <laughs> All right. Well, if no one else has any other questions, let's keep going on the conversation. I guess we get some traffic on the package base mailing list here. Um, we're happy to keep implementing and adding some of these features. I think having the object directory is a good one. Getting the meta log out, great one. Taking a look at how we can do some dependencies on the kernel and maybe assist in the upgrade process to do it safely, less friction. It's a good way to go. Oh, comp yes. Yeah, comp div, that's a must. We need that, like yesterday. I also like 100% agree. the idea to move more of the things that are defaults into HC defaults and have includes. Like we added includes to Nisha's log, but yeah. the default is still in DPC, not DPC default. So it would be nice if there was nothing to merge. ever change the default instead of not having merge conflict because you touched the file. More of that and separating out the default from what the user did so that there would be fewer of the merge conflicts to begin with. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a good direction regardless. But we'll still need a tool in the meantime. There's going to be some things we yeah. probably can't avoid. It's actually UCL. UCL, all the things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or, and that doesn't help with conflict. <laughs> <laughs> well, you separate out the default from, like, these are the ones that the OS provides, you don't touch them, you override them in your own file. That's actually not what I want, because when the OS version changes, I want to know if I have an update, so I, my custom version somehow matches the OS name right. So I actually, even if you pulled out the separate file and removed the like, spam of the conflict, I would probably still want to edit the official one, right. so that I know if you change something, so I can factor it, because you just changed my country. Yeah. You can't get around the fact that the user actually has to do something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's either changing an actual setting. It would be so much easier if it wasn't for users. You can't even care about users. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Zero. Right? <laughs> you don't have users. All right. Well, thank you guys very much. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any other questions later. Okay.